Over to you, Simon. Thanks, and poor evening, ladies and gents. Uh, Paul's wrong. You can't open in the next hour because for the next hour I talk. Um, and it is a JC Power Hour, so I will stick to my one hour time limit. I'm not going to carry on going until about 8 o'clock. I've left a lot of time for questions because I, I've got my five cents worth um, and I will throw that out there. But I appreciate it's going to be a ton of questions. Individuals are going to have you know, their own little nuances and the like. So a lot of time for questions at the end. So probably I'm about 40, 45 minutes of talking. And then we'll take uh, 15 or 20 minutes at, at the end of the presentation. Legal stuff, so that's my smiley face. So. What are we looking at? Tax-free savings account. Announced by Minister Nene in his budget speech of February, so about a month ago, just up the road from us, he announces the tax-free savings accounts. Uh, effective 1 March 2015, so they are active, they are happening already um, and, and up and running. I'm going to go into bunches of details, but the high level of them, uh, individuals only, no companies, no trusts, no, no nothing. Individual people only can open a tax-free savings account, and we can touch in a moment around minors and uh, uh, infants and the like, but this is aimed at, at individuals. We can't do any other products in that sense, and it is tax-free. There is no catch. There, there's no small print that says tax-free unless it's a Thursday or something like that. This is a tax-free product, through and through. And what do we mean by tax-free? No dividend withholding tax. So if you own a share or any, any listed product at the moment, a dividend is paid and a one rand dividend is declared, you receive 85 cents, 15 cents didn't even go into your bank account, it went straight to National Treasury, and this product you get the full one rand. So there's no dividend withholding tax, that extra, that 15% goes straight to you. There's no capital gains tax. If you sell a share and you have a capital gain, you're liable for one third of your marginal tax rate. Upper bracket is 41%, so one third of that, about 13.8% more or less, give or take a tenth, um, no capital gain. So if you buy, realize a profit within the tax-free savings account and sell it there and sell, there's no uh, uh, capital gains tax applicable on that at all. There's also no income tax. So at the moment, if you buy an equity or derivative and you buy it and sell it within, within a three-year window, SARS might turn around and say, whoop, that was for income, we're going to charge you at your marginal tax rate, which is three times what capital gains is, no income. So there's, there, there is no dividend withholding, no capital gain, no income tax, no tax on interest. So if you've got cash in the account, you earn interest, that is not applicable. Now, of course, at the moment, the way the legislation is put out, the first, uh, and I can't remember the number now, about 26,000 uh, of interest per year is tax-free. That is still applicable, still in place. What I think will happen is over the years that, that follow, go through, SARS will probably not increase that 20 odd thousand that you can have interest tax free. Or if they do increase it, they will increase it at a relatively slow rate, probably under inflation. I think they're going to broadly say, you want tax free interest? Go get a tax free savings account. So no, no tax on the interest received, no uh, security transfer tax. When you do a purchase of a security, a share or something, you pay 0.25%. That goes to National Treasury. Again, no STT. So literally zero tax. Real McCoy, no catch. Well, one catch, estate duty. When you die, it goes into your estate and forms part of your estate and is liable for estate duty. I have a simple view on that. I'm dead. I've got bigger problems. When I'm dead, you can tax me till the cows come home. That, that's fine. That's no sweat at all. So as long as you are living, that's the, that is the catch. If you are alive, there is no tax in this account. There are a bunch of rules in order for you to uh, uh, be, be, uh, get the, the dispensation, in a sense, from, from the revenue service. But it is literally the only way you're going to get taxed on this is draw the money out or death. That's it. If it stays in there, it is tax-free. So it really is completely, absolutely tax-free. <clears throat> Some buts. It has to be in a tax-free savings account, TFSA. It has to be sitting within a TFSA. You cannot nominate after the event and say, and, and have an account here and an account there and say, oh, this is my tax-free. Uh, uh. You have to open a dedicated tax-free savings account that the provider has said, this is a TFSA. Because they've got to then, when they report the, the CGTs and the like within that, and when dividends are paid, etc., they've got to be able to say, they've got to be able to flag it as a tax-free savings account. 
So it's got to be done within a TFSA. And I'll come back in a second to who those providers are, where you will find them, and then we can drill a whole bunch of questions and Q&A around that as well. And specified products. You can't put just anything into a tax-free savings account. There is a list as drawn up by uh, Revenue Service, and they say these are the only things that you can put in there. So you cannot take your holiday home from Hermanus or your red Ferrari or anything like that, or your stamp collection or wine collection or your equities or anything else. And I'll go through the list in a moment of what is, is allowed and isn't allowed. But it has to be products that are allowed to be within a tax-free savings account. And must be within limits. Um, and what I mean by limits, and I'll come back to these as well, but quickly up front, there are limits as to how much we can transfer into a TFSA. Those limits are 30,000 Rand per individual per tax year. 30,000 a year, or, or and half a million rand over a lifetime of a tax individual. So you can put in 30,000 a month, sorry, a year, and when you hit the 500,000 contributions, that's it, you cannot add to it any further. That half a million at current rates is going to take you about 16 years and eight months of doing it at the full 30,000 per year. And you, it's not that you have to put in 30. You can put in 2,500 a month. That takes you to your 30. You can put in 10,000, and then next year put in. An, but if you put in 10,000 this year, your limit next year is 30,000. You don't say, well, I did 10 this year, so I'm going to roll that 20 over. You can do 30, and it's per tax year. So 1 March to 28 or 29 February, depending whether we're leaping or not. So there's always going to be that process where it's going to be per year. Again, I imagine that over time, uh, Minister Nene and the ministers who will follow him in their annual budget speech will raise both of those two limits. Raise the 30,000 per year and raise the 500,000 for the lifetime contribution. What is important is that not roll over. What is equally important is do not exceed the limit. Don't, you know, don't, you know, when I first heard about the tax-free savings account and the, 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 the limits, I'm like, well, okay, so why don't I just put 500,000 in and 30,000 a year will become liable for the tax, no, no. If you exceed the 30,000 a year limit, you will be penalized. And the, 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 the penalty will be that you will be taxed on that, on that excess at your marginal tax rate, max 41%. And the onus is on you as the individual, as the investor, to make sure you don't exceed the limit. It is not up to the provider. It is not up to SARS. It is up to you, the individual, to make sure you don't exceed the limit. An important point, if I put 30,000 in today and I go and buy DBXWD and it goes to 31,000, that's not an exceeding the limit. That's the capital growth. So it's the amount that you can physically move in. And it is on your onus to make sure that you don't exceed it. It's not complicated, but you know, make sure if you're running an Excel spreadsheet, you know what you're doing with it and that the right amounts are going in every period for it. As I say, 500,000 lifetime limit, so at current levels, it'll take us uh, almost 17 years to get to that full limit. And as I say, it will likely be adjusted over time, and that uh, in the budget speeches every year, we would expect increases of both the 30,000 and the 500,000. And again, they won't be retroactive. It will be, well, from this March, instead of 30, you can do 32 or whatever the case may be. So I suspect that by the time we get to 17 years, we're probably going to have been able to put in seven, 800,000, maybe even a million rand um, because of those increases in the, in the two respective limits. Critical, cash only. You can only deposit cash into a tax-free savings account. You cannot take an existing exchange-traded fund that you own and move it into a tax-free savings account. If you've got some Satrix 40s, whatever they might be, and you want to put them into a tax-free savings account, you need to sell the Satrix 40, take the cash, move the cash into the tax-free savings account, and buy the Satrix 40. You cannot transfer a cost. And it, it didn't make sense to me, but when you drill it, and, the, and it, I was chatting with someone in National Treasury last week, and their response is quite simple. It's the complexity of, so if you move shares, at what price did they move? What happens if you move Satrix and it's 30,000, but whilst it's moving, the price of Satrix goes up to 31,000, so they want cash only. You could only put cash into a TFSA. Again, that is on your responsibility. Depending where you house the product, and we'll talk about that in a moment, depending where you house it, it is possible that you know, your, your provider, would, would the, the platform will let you move an equity or an ETF in. 
and that's on your owners to make sure that it's only cash that is being moved into the TFSA. So here's an example which uh, sourced from Sunlam Outrad, Shalit Lumpen. So on the surface of it, you look at 30,000 a year, you look at 500,000 a lifetime, and you think, yeah, nice lacquer, but really, what's the, you know, what's the impact? And, and so there are, as always, when you're looking into the future, anytime beyond the immediate, there are a lot of if, buts, and maybes. But in this example, what they've got here, purple at the bottom is a contribution of uh, 30,000 a year, down at 2,500 per month. And at 16 years, at eight months, it flattens out because you've now put your 500,000 in. Your uh, orange or yellow bit there is your return on the investment. And that blue bit at the top is the amount that you've saved on tax. They've run this for 25 years. But short version, your deposits in was about 500,000. Your return was about 1 million. And the savings from tax was almost half a million. So it's actually fairly significant. And as always, I mean, you can see in the early years, not a heck of a lot happening, but it really starts to happen towards the end. And of course, if we push that to 40 years, it would be even more significant over time. Because what's happening is, is that we're compounding on compounding on compounding. We're not paying the tax. So the first year, you get a dividend and you get the full rand instead of 85 cents. And you're like, yeah, oh, I got an extra 15 cents, but you invest it. And the next year, you get some, some dividend on that little bit of extra money that you didn't have to pay the tax on. So it's that compounding effect. And it becomes immensely powerful. As I said, tons of if, buts, and maybes. And I won't delve into what they are. But obviously, when Sunlam were putting this together, they had to make some assumptions. Um, but short version is, is that it becomes massively powerful given that time. It's the power of compound. And you're basically compounding it into your future rather than paying it out SARS. So they've done a rate of growth of inflation plus four um, and include and, and assumed no fees. Big if. But uh, so inflation, inflation pl and a personal tax rate of, of 40%, but that's smooth. Inflation plus four, that's quite reasonable. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with that. That's not a crazy return. And the fact that they're saying no fees doesn't stress me because, you know, let's say fees are 1%, well then inflation plus five, I still don't think is, a, is an onerous ask for a long-term investment. So what products can you put into a tax-free savings account? And I'll, in two slides, I'll come to what you can't put, because that's maybe the list you want to see more, but this is the more important one. Collective investment schemes, which are exchange-traded funds and unit trusts. They can be added in to the scheme. Um, not not exchange-traded notes and not exchange-traded funds that co uh, cover commodities. My next slide will show you the list of exchange-traded funds that can go in. You cannot, for example, put new gold or, or platinum or any of those in, even though they are an ETF. Exchange traded fund, quick uh, touch on. We, we understand, I'm pretty sure, what unit trusts are. Asset managers such as Alan Gray, Coronation, Momentum, many of them in South Africa, take investors' money, pool it, invest it, trying to beat the market. Exchange traded funds say, no, no, that looks like hard work. Why don't we just go buy the market? So in the top 40 ETF, they go and buy the 40 shares that are in that, that, that index put those 40 shares in a basket, sell you the basket. Nice and simple. So that's essentially what we're looking at. And so they're not looking to beat the market. They are looking to give you market performance. Point being is market performance is a wonderful thing. Over the long term, when I talk long term, I'm talking decades. Over the long term, your best performing asset class is the equity market. I've got data 1960 to date. And if I take any 20-year period, the best performing asset class has been the stock market. So my view is broadly, you know, if I'm buying that asset class and I'm getting, you know, just buy the market, and that's what we do with exchange traded funds. Structured products, we're starting to see some structured products arrive already. These will come predominantly from the long-term insurers, um, and they will be in a variety of different uh, ways and means and complexities and, and, and products within them. But certainly, and there are, requirements for those structured products. Obviously, the long-term insurers will make sure that their products meet those requirements, and you'll then be able to buy uh, those in tax-free savings accounts as well. Um, you can put cash in. And we're already seeing some of the institutions offering uh, cash tax-free savings accounts. That doesn't massively, in fact, I'll be perfectly honest, that bores me to tears. Uh, cash is like, like boring. I mean, like, what are you going to do? You're getting currently 5%. So whoop, the bank like does you a deal and gives you 6%. Um, 
okay, so you're ahead of inflation by like your much, and you're going nowhere. Yeah, yeah, we want to create wealth, cash is really, go put the cash in the bank and pay the tax on the interest. You know, so we are seeing some cash coming in, but I, I, to me, that's not the purpose of them. I get, it's legal. It's within the, the ambit and the product will be offered, but that doesn't throw me in the least. The retail savings bonds as offered by the uh, National Treasury. So we've got the South African government retail savings bonds, which the uh, post office sells um, and some other retailers. Typically, your lock-ins are one, three, or five years. You can get inflation linked and uh, just an, a, a, a normal bond price linked. They, they're nice. I mean, the key fee, the best part about a retail savings bond is that uh, zero fees, and I suppose we can say that they're risk-free because, in truth, if the South African government defaults on debt to its own citizens, we have bigger problems. We are probably queuing to get into Zimbabwe. Um, no, we, we've got real problems if our government is defaulting on our debt. So, yeah, the retail savings bonds are there, a very low risk and, ergo, a very low return. Better than cash, but only just, just, just better than cash. And then certain endowment policies, again, offered by the long-term insurers. I am not a fan of endowment policies in the least. They typically seem to be designed to make somebody else money rather than me. But nonetheless, there will be some endowment policies offered in that space as well. There is the list of the 38 exchange-traded funds that are available to be purchased within a tax-free savings account. And I'll come to practicalities of how in a moment. So up at the top there, you've got your internationals, which are your five DBX funds. You've got your two properties. Uh, there's a third property in your equal weighted, along with your BBET40, which is your equal weighted top 40. You've got your uh, JC index ones, your RMBs, your, your top 40s, Indies, Finnies, Resis, and SWIX. From a couple of different issuers, you'll see that there are three top 40 funds. You've got your debt cash, which is your NFGV. Uh, your NF uh, Elbow, your RMB, so th those are your 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 bond linked ones. Your RAFI, Research Affiliate Fundamental Indexation. So they take the same 40 shares from the top 40, but they weight them according to five fundamental pieces of data: cash flow, increase in profitability, uh, dividends, and two others that escape my mind right now. We've got someone said price to book is one, number five. Surely that's too random. Yeah. yeah. So if you go Google Raffi, you'll find it. Uh, there are a couple from ABSA, and then there are a couple from uh, Satrix as well. Uh, and then the, what I call the bespoke ones, the B Green, which is a net bank product, which is companies that have a green rank, rating above a certain level can be included. The Momentum one from, the, uh, from ABSA, the Sharia compliant fund from ABSA, and the low volatility tracker from uh, Grinrod, the two dividends, excuse me, sat, a dividend plus from Citrix, and the S&P SA dividend aristocrats also from uh, Grinrod, and then your two balanced. And what I mean by balanced is these are products coming out of ABSA, and they're actually a basket. So what they're doing is they've got a blend of a bit of cash, a bit of equity, and a bit of uh, 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 bond. You've got the growth one, which is slightly higher risk, and then you've got the protect one, lower risk, in other words, less equity, more uh, debt instruments and the like. What is not there are exchange traded notes. And what is not there is exchange traded funds issued over commodities. So new gold, new plat, et cetera, is not there. You know, like there's no SBAEI, Standard Bank Africa Equity Index, because that is an exchange traded note. But that said, with those 38 ETFs, you can do almost anything. You can build yourself a nice, diverse portfolio. By diverse, I mean geographically diverse. I mean uh, industry diverse. And I mean currency diverse. And beyond that, product diverse. So you can go and have your, your lower risk cash and bonds. You can go and have your international exposure. You can have your property exposure. You can have your equity, local and foreign equity exposure. You can take that portfolio that you've self-constructed and you can significantly reduce the risk profile by upweighting bonds and, and, and sort of those sort of lower risk, high yield products and downweighting your equity products. So it really is with that range of 38 ETFs, you can do as, as complex and as diverse and you can run it through sharp ratios and get portfolios that will meet the vast majority of, of those requirements. So although it's only 38, and I mean, I'm, and I'll touch on it in a moment, I have bought two and there's a third one on my list. 
that I will buy in the next tax year starting March 2016. But when I look at that, to me, everything I need sits right there. I, I you know, uh, would I like to add my Capitex in there? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, of course. Um, but no equities. So can't do it. I'm comfortable with that there. Pause a sec. Any questions on that list there? They will charge fees in two places. They have internal fees, total expense ratios, the fee of running the fund. Well, so those, those TERS are ranging from 0.2% in some cases up to 0.84% for the DBX ones. First fee, second fee, transaction fee, and I'll touch on that in a moment. Third fee, admin slash platform fee. So there's always fees. Uh, they, 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 you know, this might be a free presentation, but beyond this, there are no free lunches. So. And, and this really is free. The gentleman at the door is not going to knock you over for 10 bucks on your way out. Um, it is a, uh, the, the PowerPoint, will, will, um, Paul will have it. I will have it. It's on my, if you go to blog.justonelap.com, if you drop me a mail, Simon at Just One Lap, I will send it to you. Yeah. So what we're seeing, and let's pause a moment. What we're seeing is... The service providers being a little bit slow on the uptake. And what I mean by that is today is the 26th of March. This has been alive for 26 days, and there are providers who are not yet providing. And I'm like, come on, guys, like what's taking? You know, I did this presentation in Durban, was it a week ago, two weeks ago? And at that point, I hadn't been able to source this list. In fact, that's not true. I had three lists, and they were all different. I didn't know which one was accurate. Um, it was about Monday of this week, I think, when I actually got confirmation that that is the real McCoy. Um, and and it, you know, so what we're seeing is a little bit of a slowness on, on, on the uptake. In short answer, as a provider who's offering you the facility, you should be able to say, well, what are the applicable product? And they will be able to provide that list. In the meantime, drop me a mail, go to the website. It is available. That's what you can't buy. No shares at all. Zero. No Capitex. No nothing. No shares in your tax-free savings account. Obviously, we get shares because those have all got shares in them. What I mean is no individual shares. So you cannot go and, 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 and put your own bespoke portfolio that you've carefully crafted and put together to create significant wealth over time. You cannot put that into your tax-free savings account. The shares have to come in via collective investment schemes, ETFs and the like, structured products, etc. So no individual shares allowed. No ETNs, no REITs. Real estate investment trusts, again, they do sit up there in the property equal weight and in the two SAPI property ones. But there was, and the reason I've put that there is there was talk initially that you were able to buy REITs within these funds. That is not the case. They are classed as individual shares, although they're retail estate investment trusts, like real estate, sorry, uh, investment trusts. I get that. You cannot put a REIT directly in. You'd have to buy a exchange traded fund of property. No policies. In other words, if you've got retirement annuities, endowment policies, or anything like that, they cannot be transferred in. And no derivatives. With one exception, the structured products can use derivative, uh, product, uh, derivative instruments to reduce downside risk. What is critically important, and this is part of the, the document from SARS, and, and how SARS will measure this, I'm not sure, but SARS essentially say it's allowed to provide downside protection, but it's not allowed to provide upside enhancement. In other words, what they're really talking about is put options. So if the, if the product which is issued over falls, the put option rises, and it gives you some offset on that downside. It doesn't enhance the upside. In fact, it slightly detracts from the upside because the put option costs money. So they've had to purchase the put option, and they couldn't go and buy all of the other assets. So for me and you as individuals, no derivatives. There will be some within the structured products. I haven't yet seen any sort of really innovative or wildly excited structured products at all. Um, I, in fact, I think I've seen one structured product. It was deadly boring. It, it just held cash and some bonds. And then, as I said, the cash products. And, and well, cash really is boring. I mean, cash is lovely, but not for investing. <laughs> So now we want to take money out. We've hoid a whole lot of money in. We're doing lacquer. We're rich. But now we've got a big date. Or we want to buy a house or something like that. We want to take some money out of our tax-free savings account. The good news is you can. The bad news is when it's out, it is out. It cannot go back in. So what I mean by that is you can withdraw. There's no limit. So you go and tomorrow morning, you first thing you do is open a tax-free savings account and you drop your 30000 in. And in a month's time, it's grown to 31000 And you think, woo-hoo. So you draw the money out and you go and have a wild evening in the streets of Cape Town. 
that 30,000 is gone and cannot be re-added. In other words, you have exceed, you've hit your limit for this year. But more importantly, it is deducted from your lifetime limit and cannot be put in. So your lifetime limit is 500,000. You deposit 30,000 in, your lifetime limit is now 470,000. You've got the 30 year in, you've got 470 to go. You take that 30 out, your lifetime limit remains 470. In other words, money that is withdrawn cannot go back in. I get why they're doing it. Uh, whether I agree or not, frankly, SARS doesn't really care. Um, but it is critically important. What we're therefore saying is that in the ideal world, we want to put money into these TFSAs that we do not need for the next 17 years. The truth of the matter is your ability to see 17 years into the future is exactly the same as mine. Zero. So yes, things will happen. You know, life is a curveball most of the time. So if that curveball comes along and you need to get some money out, you can. You just can't put it back in. You can take your profit. But you can't, you still can't put back in. Profit, yeah. Profit. Correct or under. So money out doesn't go back in at all. So it cannot be added with it. What you can do is you can sell within a TFSA. So you went and bought the Finney ETF, Satrix Finney. Because you know what? Banks are rocking, and that's how you get your Capitec exposure because it's in the Finney 15. Well, at this rate, it's actually going to the top 40, but what the heck. And you banks are rocking, and you're loving it. And then you have an epiphany. Banks are going to do terrible, so you sell your Satrix Finney, and you go buy Satrix Resi. And Satrix Resi is rocking. That's not a withdrawal. And you can transact within these accounts. You absolutely can. Uh, and some of you folks will know I do the lazy trading system on a weekly chart where I trade indices, but I trade the ETFs. And I'm going to trade them in here. Absolutely. Not initially, because in the first year, 30,000, just the numbers are just not viable. It's just not a viable proposition. But once I've got, you know, in a couple of years, when my, when my pool of cash is large, large enough, I'm going to move my lazy ETF trading system into my TFSA. Because that, that, that system is generating around 34% per year. And then the taxman comes along and takes their slice, and it's not so attractive. If I can do 34% a year tax-free, man, that becomes a party. So who can provide them? Well, banks, of course. Government, always. Uh, brokers, as in stock brokers. I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, the long-term insurers. You understand who they are. They're going to pr predominantly do the environment-related policies, and they will obviously do the structured products as well. Um, your government is good. You, the only thing the government will be doing is the government retail savings bonds. Um, banks so far have only done cash tax-free savings accounts. As I said, completely boring. Uh, your investment platforms, your collective investment scheme managers will be able to offer this as well. So, and as I say, at this point in time, I mean, pretty much if you've, if you bought an ETF anywhere, that ETF provider will at some point in the very near future, if not yet already, enable you to have a tax-free savings account. What's happening, as I said, is that they're just being a little slow on the uptake. There were, well, as I know, there was one that was ready on the, on the 1st of, 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 of March. Um, there are a couple of others who have come to the party subsequent to that. Uh, and certainly, I mean, as far as I know, all of the stockbrokers are going to be doing it. Some of them will be doing slightly different products in different ways and methodologies that are with the banks. But we, if we reconvene in a year, we could pretty much say probably in a year's time, everybody will have the offerings. They just haven't got them together yet. So that process is taking time. Um, the one that obviously attracts me most is the, is the brokers. We'll delve on that. We can go into specifics around that when we come to the, to the, to the, to the Q&A part. But that's where we're going to find the space where we can go and buy the ETF that we want. What we are seeing is some platforms saying, well, we will sell you a, a basket of ETFs. And, and for a lot of people, that's great. But for, I think, the, the people in the room here this evening, we are probably a little smarter than a basket. You know, we, we don't need you to build our four or five ETFs. We're going to say, no, no, we want that one, that one, that one. Or maybe we just want that one, as the case may be. And I'll touch in a moment on which ones I've particularly looked at. Um, so we are seeing some baskets of those coming through at, at this point. But to me, what the exciting point is, it's via the brokers. I, I on day one, uh, on, on, on 2nd of March, half past 8 in the morning, logged onto my broker account, uh, opened a TFSA account. Process happened overnight. Next morning, it's opened. Moved my 30,000 rand and bought myself two ETFs. That was all done by sort of half past 10 on the Tuesday morning. And then in a year's time, I'll come back and move another 30 and, and do it again. So fees, because aside from this evening's presentation, there really aren't very few free lunches. 
Um, so there will be a brokerage fee. What we are seeing so far is that everyone has offered a discount brokerage fee. So they've dropped their rate. So if your stockbroker typically charges you know, 95 Rand or 0.6%, they'll say, look, in a TFSA, we will charge a lower fee. Um, and if you don't like the fee, shop around, as always. Um, statutory fees. So there's no STT. But for example, VAT on brokerage. And I know, VAT's a tax. I get it. That maybe is the small print part. But most important is straight. Straight is your secured uh, uh, transfer, 11 Rand 58. Straight is given a 70 odd percent discount. So you're paying a, a minute amount in terms of the straight. There's no STT. And we really are seeing very, very cheap. I mean, my two transactions, uh, per each of them at 15,000 a transaction, and now I can't remember, I think it was 0.4% all-inclusive. Everything, 0.4. That's nice and cheap. That's nice and cheap. Um, of course, there may be admin fees. The platform that you are on will potentially charge admin fees, much as your stockbroker charges you a monthly or quarterly fee, um, as much as your, your platform that you're using is charging you a fee. So they may elect to, to charge fees. Again, if those fees look onerous, real simple, shop around. And there can be advisor fees. Now, I don't think we're going to see a lot of advisors selling these products. Simple reason, there's just not enough commission in them for them. Now, how, much, how much money can you really make on a 30,000 Rand per year transaction? But nonetheless, if, the, if you are going through an intermediary, through a financial advisor, they are allowed to charge a fee as well. And then, of course, some platform fees, which in many cases will be your admin fees. It will broadly be the same in that space there. So some watch outs, costs, I mean, always, watch out for the costs. Yeah, that, that picture I showed you earlier about how wonderful and everything that the, that the that how much, you know, half a million in contributions, a million in returns and half a million in tax saved, all very nice, uh, but that was X fees to your question. So uh, fees are always, 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 always. We understand the power of compounding interest. Fees are exactly the other side of the coin. They are being compounded out of your future, um, and it can massively hurt. You do it by presentation on Monday evening. I show you that horrible chart of what a difference of just two percent a year can make in terms of fees to what your ultimate value is at the end of a twenty-year period. So there are fees. Watch out for withdrawals. If you have to, you have to. You know, but if it's a case of, you know, I don't know, you, your favorite wine estate's got a special on their wine. Don't sell your tax-free savings account. You know, maybe pass up the special on one. Maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe pawn the dog or something like that. Don't, don't exit. But if there is a crisis and you need the cash, it is available. You can withdraw. It. That's not a problem at all. So it is easily available in, in, in that sense there. Watch out for those limits. 30000 a year, 500000 a lifetime. Someone's going to make a mistake on that. SARS is going to penalize you heavily. And the onus is on you. It is not up to the provider. It is not up to the platform. It is not up to the product. It is up to the individual to make sure you don't exceed those limits. So what to buy? For me, I bought BBET40 and DBXWD. So BBET40, and I just did 15,000 each. DB, about BBET40 is the top 40 index. It is the 40 shares that make up the top 40 index, but equal weighted, 2.5% each. I prefer the equal weighting. You know, yes, at the moment, um, the, on the latest numbers, NASPAS and SAB make up 22% of the top 40. And at this point in time, that's a great thing because those stocks are doing good. But they're not always going to be the best two stocks. And I don't know when they will stop being the best two stocks. But at some point in my lifetime, assuming I make it home to Josie tomorrow, at some point in my lifetime, they will stop being the best two stocks. And now you've suddenly got the massive weight in your, in your, in your, in your product, and they're going to start drift down. Just a quick po a side point, there is another rule where no, no, no equity, no, no individual stock can be more than 10% within the tax-free savings account. That is, not, that is not applicable if you are buying an exchange-traded fund. It is for the structured product and the endowment providers. So I buy the BBET40 equal weight. Every one of those 40 shares is 2.5% uh, administered by Nedbank and being, uh, yeah, Grinrod Bank have purchased it and will take it over in the next couple of months. I then buy DBXWD, which is the MCSI Worldwide Index. That is currently around 57% US. 
around 11% each to Japan, the European Union, and the UK, respectively. And then the rest is, is the other bits and pieces around. It is a US dollar denominated index. So they take your rands, they turn it into dollars. So I get currency hedge, and I get global exposure. So what you do, so it's a great question. So an American company, so dividend tax in America is 30%. Okay, As an individual, if you go and invest in America and pay tax in South Africa, you can re uh, apply for what is called relief at source. You pay a fee and, that comp and then you only get taxed at 15%. At this point in time, so the DBXU, the, the, the data bank administrators apply for relief, which means they get taxed 15%. You're saying, oh, is that being relieved? Short answer, don't know. Long answer, I imagine not. Because so, I mean, American governments want some pound of flesh too. Sure. They've got habits. Sure. No, no. So, so, so they knock it down to 15%. And what we see in America is a lowish dividend payment because of that high rate. So what the, what the big f f uh, rage in America is share buybacks. Um, because that's, that's a more efficient way of, of returning in inverted commas the, the profit to shareholders than a dividend which attracts a 30% uh, dividend tax. So an average portfolio manager would not be applicable. Of course, there are portfolio managers out there who are Category 2 licenses. Um, and, and then, of course, they can set up and make that happen indeed. Um, and then the question I was asked on Twitter was, what about the PropTrax 10, PTX 10? And short answer is I like it, and short answer it would be added in. But at this point, I think property is expensive. In truth, I said that 15, 18 months ago, and so far I've just been looking stupid. At some point, I will stop looking stupid, and I will say I told you so. Um, until then, I just pretend I never sold my property holdings 18 months ago. So but th that I'll worry about. So probably what I would do next year is take my 30,000 and put 10, 10, 10. And, and over time, I will build it. And I understand I'm, 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 I'm you know, mid-40s, I've got time on, on my side, etc. I will slowly over time build it this to slightly more diverse. So next year, I'll add some property to it. And maybe, in, in a, in a, maybe at some point, some, some inflation link to, I don't know if I really would want to add, but you know, that sort of thing. I'm in no rush to, to quickly make this a low-risk portfolio. At, at my risk profile, I, I quite am able to embrace the risk. So I'm comfortable with it at this point in time. So, so, so the, okay, so let's, let's talk on the Chorin issue. A couple of issues. Firstly, under the age of seven, they are an infant, nothing you can do. When they hit seven, they become a minor. As a minor, you can open a tax-free savings account for them. You need a birth certificate from the child, and you need FICA from the guardian or the parent, as the case may be. Um, but then, the, so you only open it at seven, but you're 100% right. Then you've hit their limit at 23, uh, and, and, but maybe at 18 they draw it out for varsity. That's very nice, but you've now, you know, stolen is the wrong word, but you get what, I, what, what, what we're saying, is you've taken their, their, their capacity there. So my first thought... Well, that's just the problem. You know, I buy for my niece and nephew, but I'm giving them that money when they're 50. No, because think about it, 20, right? 20, what are they going to do? Sex, drugs, rock and roll, motorcycles, no chance. 30 years old, no chance. Someone's going to marry them for their money. 40, midlife crisis, another motorcycle, no chance. They get it when they're 50. But I made a rookie error. I told them about it. I shouldn't have ever told them. But here's the question that I'm currently doing. So I have opened the TFSA for my nephew because he turned seven last Monday. I haven't yet put money in because of your issue there. Do I want to use up his TFSA? don't know. I, I, and I don't know the answer. It's, it's a great question. I'm probably not going to. I'm probably going to say to him, you know what, this money which you get, really, when you're 50, I'm quite dead serious about that. And he'll hate me, but I'll be dead, so it's not my problem. Um, I'm probably not going to. And then, so a last point on, 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 on the miners, and this was important because it took forever and a day to finally get the answer, is that the money can only be paid out into a bank account in that miner's name. Which is easy. I mean, you can open a bank account for a minor, no problem at all. But the point is that you cannot transfer it into your bank account and you buy the motorcycle. Um, it's got to go into a bank account in the miner's name, if and when. So I'm with you, ma'am. I'm on that dilemma. And I'm probably not going to use it for my niece and nephew. I will let them do it at their own point. And this was also a great area. I'll get to the question there in a second. The short answer is, is that there's no limit to how many accounts that you can have. And the long answer is it's your onus to make sure that there's that you don't exceed those limits. So, so th and there could be the complexity. So I open one for the kid. The father opens one for a kid. The, you don't tell him. And I don't tell him because I'm keeping it a secret from the whole family because I don't trust any of them. We all throw money into it, and one day. And he texts his folks. The kid. 
why you see, and there, but I'll make it the father's problem, not mine. But yes, and, and ultimately the tax liability is to the to the parent or the guardian. So it would be my sister or. You know, but the penalty, the SARS will flag it on an annual basis. So it gets submitted into tax return. I buy ETS for my sister. That gets submitted in her annual tax return at this point. Um, and now that he is seven, so what I did when he turned seven two weeks ago, literally, I opened a TFSA account. And then I stopped and paused for your question. What I'm going to probably do is I'll open him a vanilla brokerage account and move it into that vanilla brokerage account. So the requirement is, from a provider perspective, be that a broker or whatever the platform is, is that they need to issue uh, ITB3s and ITBCs. So is it Cs and Bs? The, 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 and those are then issued, and that is a requirement from the, that. That is a legal requirement. One is basically a, a profit and loss statement. One is basically how much interest that you have earned, and this is for tax. There will now be an additional, essentially, on there, which will say this is a ticked as a TFSA account. And if you submit that documentation to SARS and they see that you've put forty-five thousand in instead of thirty, that's how they catch you. So does your nephew at seven now become a taxpayer? No, the you tax. The tax. Otherwise, how do you record the thirty thousand? So that was the big, massive debate that we have. Technically, my sister is the liable for it, and I thought I couldn't do it because he doesn't have a tax number. But SARS has said, no, no, the individual does not need to have a tax number at all. They will reference it to ID number. It's like, well, cool, my nephew doesn't have an ID number either, but SARS is saying, no, because it is in his name, and he's been fecured, and his name is Zakes Willen, and my sister is Samantha Willen, they're separate, so SARS will view them as that pointed separate. Could it be an admin nightmare come tax? It could. I mean, time will tell. I mean, we are 26 days into this process. For somebody with five kids, how is someone going to figure it out? Well, they each have a, well, I was going to say they each have a different name. I mean, hopefully they each, <laughs> unless it's a crazy household. Ma'am. Yes. So I've seen a, pro a prototype from my stockbroker, and basically on it, there is a thing that says tax free savings account, and there is a tick or there is a cross. No, there's some admin nightmares here. I mean, Tom, this is early days, guys. We're 26 days into the process, but there, there is, there might be some admin challenges down the line, ma'am. So, in the case of my, in the, in the case of, in the case of my nephew, he, it's a birth certificate which proves that he is Zakes Willen, but the issue is the ID number and the FICA documentation is my sister. So, what we've essentially got for SARS's purpose is there one ID number, two names. But you are right, and a lot of stuff, and I, I don't know if it's happened yet, but where brokers are submitting directly. For example, I mean, when last did anyone get an IRP5? We don't. It just goes direct. Um, and we're gonna, that's going to be happening more and more and more. The, the document, you know, basically, your tax return will be just be a case of SARS will say, send us X. And you can either send it or object. I mean, no longer, I mean, even the e-filing is going to fall away. So it's going to be SARS is going to say, you know what, we know everything about you. Just sort of send us money. <laughs> So a quick recap, 30,000 a year, 500,000. And I know I've now said that five times. So I won't say it a six, maybe. But that is critical. And yes, it will increase. I imagine in his budget speech for February next year, Minister Nene will stand up up the road there in Parliament and push it from 30 to 32 and push it from 500 to 510, whatever the case may be. It will increase. It will increase slowly. I mean, maybe at the rate of inflation. I mean, don't expect it to, to storm along, but it will slowly increase. Individuals only. No trusts, no partnerships, no CCs, no PTYs, no nothings. Individuals only. Yes, that individual. Obviously, within the, 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 the appointed products, which are exchange-traded funds, because as the next line says, no shares. But yes, it can be a full managed by you, the individual account. Yes. And to my mind, I mean, that, that, and that, as I said, you know, for a lot of people in the streets of Cape Town, maybe less so, but I think for people in this room, we probably know, we, we certainly know a heck lot more than, than, than the average person, um, just by the proxy that you're here this evening, and you know what JSC stands for. Um, you do, hey? Johannesburg Securities Exchange, anyone know? Okay. Um, and, 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 but we can, we can say, I want that ETF, I want that ETF, not that one. Hey, I, I own this one, but now I'm going to sell it. Um, so it's ex exchange traded funds, that's what we focus on. To my mind, it's those. No tax, zero tax, except when you're dead. Bigger problems. My, to, and to my mind, I mean, to, so, so I, I said, and Paul was wrong, you couldn't do it in the next hour because I was speaking, but you can now do it in the next hour if you rush home in time. Um, 
I expected, so, so this, the latest, the, 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 it's been around for a while, there's been talks and meetings and this has been progressing and conversations with the stock exchange and, and treasury and all of this. And I expected a product that I would have a lot of holes to poke at it. And in truth, I've got two and none of them are very massive. One is I would like to do shares in it. I understand why SARS does not want you to allow shares because you might have taken your 30,000 and gone and bought African Bank. And your 30,000 is now zero. So SARS is in a sense, and I get that they're being a little nanny-ish, but you know what, what the heck, I, I can actually live with that. And I also object to the 30,000 per year and 500,000 lifetime. Two things, A, it will increase, and B, it's a 1% percenter problem. The vast majority of South Africans are not saving 30,000 a year. And, and, and SARS is aiming at a, at, a, at a broad mass product. I'll be through this a moment, sir. Um, so to my mind, you know, is it a should you or shouldn't you? You absolutely should. I mean, what I did was uh, when I say I opened one for me, I opened one for, I, I managed my sister's account and I opened for everyone. <laughs> went and bought them. Now, in the case of my sister, she doesn't have 30,000 Rand. So I went and sold some of her ETFs that she holds in her, in her vanilla account, transferred the 30,000 Rand. She's got a CGT hit on that sale. But remember that you've got your first 30,000 of CGT per year is tax-free. And I'm only selling 30,000 worth. So I think her CGT was 5,000. Um, you know, so there's no tax there. So what there is is a transaction on the sale, a transaction on the purchase. So there's some transaction fee. And I will do that every year on the last day of February. I will sell her 30,000 of ETFs. And on the first day of March, I will buy her 30,000 of ETFs until she either can afford the two and a half a month or hits the 500,000 limit. Um, so, so really, I, I see no drawbacks. I, I, there's some small limitations, but short answer, I think it's an absolutely brilliant product. So you had a question. I thought there would be. No, I thought there would be. So I thought that SARS might say, if you're 65 or older or whatever the age SARS would elect to. Because you don't have a 16-year window. Well, <laughs> but you know what SARS is telling you? So SARS is telling you that, so if you are, if you are 60 today, you've got a 50% chance of making it to 90. The first person to live to 150 is already alive. Oh, look, it's my mother-in-law, so don't worry about it. It's, you know, but it, 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 I thought there would be a concession. So what I thought SARS would say is that at a, a limit, 65, 75, whatever, at a certain age point, you, your annual limit falls away and perhaps you can just rush it up, etc. They didn't. Um, I, there's no direct, no one will tell me why. I know there was discussions around it, but then it didn't go anywhere. What it might be, they might be concerned around abuse that you quickly drop your, your 500,000 in and, and the benefit, the person who benefits from it might not be you, but the heirs of your estate. Um, will they change it in time? I, th I mean, I, I think we will see some, some small changes. I think broadly as a product, it's going to stay the same. I don't think we're ever going to see shares in it. I think it's pretty much going to stay as it is. I think we will see the limits increase. Um, <coughs> there might be some, some, uh, tweaks around the process, as I'll be in a sec, just you know, because there might be some issues coming up that we'll hit into and SARS will discover them. They may do a tax free savers for, for, for what's the polite term again? 60 pluses. 60 pluses. Well, you see, now you're pushing it. SARS is going to say nonsense. 70 pluses. Yeah. So, so, going back to the so, you know what? A lot of folks, and let's get back to that product page. I've had a lot of folks who say, well, they. they that they're going to go for the, the high dividend products. Firstly, so the Satrix Div is a modesty one. The S&P SA dividend Aristocats is, I can't, is an all right. Your highest Divi one is probably one of these property ones. The point is, is that an asset class gives a return, and that return is broadly made up of, of two things. It's the return of the asset and then the, the income derived from the asset. Um, and if you look at property, I mean, at the moment, in the last 10 years, property has been the out-and-out out winner. It's given, annualized, I think, 19.4. Equity is given 18.1. But, but over the longer term, equity wins, but it's that total package. The question is, is that if you're looking for cash extraction, not to take and spend, but to take and buy something else, then yes. I, I ran it around in my head and I ran some calcs and the like, and the increased dividend yield is, is not in, increased. I, I see why we're doing it. The 15% falls away. So maybe, here's where I settled on. Let's say I've got some high dividend stock uh, ETFs in my portfolio already. Would I transfer those first? Yes. Yes, because here I've already, let's say I'm earning 30,000 a year in dividends and I'm paying 15% to SARS. I switch that to there, boom, I'm saving myself 4,500. So my view was if I've got a high dividend yield product already that I want to keep, I will sell and move that across it.
Um, I don't. I have Satrix Divi, which is a three odd percent dividend yield. It's nice, but it's not that high. So that to me was it. If, if I've got something already that's costing me a lot in terms of, of tax. Ah, it depends who you're transacting. So for me, a 1,000 Rand, no, I lie. For me, a 300 Rand transaction is going to cost me 1.1%. Uh, so what's that? I mean, it, it, it's it's niche. So and and it's 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 perhaps unique to my provider, but my provider is is basically making it viable for me to actually do incredibly small transactions and to reinvest. And to reinvest. So if I got 900 bucks of dividends, so what I will probably do on a quarterly basis is because I want to yeah, is take my and dividends whatever it might be, a couple hundred rand. It's going to cost me a little, but it's not going to cost me the hundred bucks that it would cost in a vanilla brokerage account because of the the fee structures. It's going to depend on what on how well those that, that portfolio is doing relative to the stockbrokers. Because what you what you can do is if you've got a portfolio of, of individual shares, a broker can go and pick a couple of really quality companies that are paying really really good dividends. Um, and could we replicate that dividend yield of your portfolio in the exchange traded fund? Excuse me. Short short answer. It's going to, so then it depends. So if we look at the ETFs that are there, none of them are really, except for the property ones, let's ignore those for a sec. Um, if we look at like the, 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 the two dividend ones, we are looking at, at yields there of around three on the one and about 3.6 on the other. None of them brilliantly spectacular. We've got the prefix, um, which is preference shares, which is offering a dividend yield that's probably closer to four and a half or five percent. Um, but there you get no capital appreciation. So that's not particularly thrilling. So then it's the property guys. And and yeah, I would imagine that a, a concentrated portfolio focusing on dividends, a dividend yield will beat all of those. Um, and, I mean, when I, look, when I first heard of these, I mean, what did I want to do? I wanted to trade Aussie futures in here. I didn't. I mean, of course. Um, you know, day traded, 100 trades a day. And But no, you can do as many trades as you want. That's not a problem. No CGT, no nothing. Of course, there are transaction fees per transaction, um, but certainly you can you can what we would call trade in that account. Absolutely no problem at all. As long as it stays within. As long as it stays stays within and stays within. A, a last point, I'll be in a sec, sir. So uh, uh, another point that's important, perhaps, is that in the first year you cannot switch providers. In other words, if you've got a product to provider A and suddenly provider B is looking more attractive in terms of 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 costs or something, you cannot switch. The provider. As of 1 March 2016, i.e. at the end of this tax year, you will be able to switch providers. So you'll be able to say, take my TFSA from broker A and move it to broker C. But you can't do that in the first year. So on the stockbroker side, we've got uh, standard online share trading, both their share trading platform as well as their within internet banking. And you can transact in either. Um, FMB has an offering. Um, PSG is o PSG, but the only offering collective investment schemes are they not? So PSG is only doing in the unit trust space. Uh, ABSA is not yet up and running, um, but I expect it to fairly shortly. Um, and uh, Sunlum, our free focus is up. Sunlum is up, and who's the other one? Is Lachai up? Not yet. The short answer is, Abith, remember, the short answer is, is simply phone your broker tomorrow morning at five past seven and say, do you have TFSA? And if they say no, cool, put the phone down. Phone at five past eight and say, so is it ready yet? <laughs> no, but what have they been doing for 26 days? So we will get there. And if they haven't, I mean, harass them. Absolutely harass them. And they will all be up. I mean, I said earlier that by this time next year, in truth, that's not true. By this time, third quarter, Pretty much everyone will have their offerings. It's, it is not a, I mean, look, I'm not an IT expert, but from my understanding of the process, it's like, you know, four lines of code and two clicks. Um, they do have an offering, yes. Launched on Tuesday. I, I have a bugbear with it, but I will first speak to Narina Fisser before I bug my bugbear. <laughs> well, Narina's cleverer than me, so I'm going to go that bugbear very carefully. Sorry? Yeah, so they'd have, they, they launched that uh, Tuesday evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, my, I will chat with Narina on my bag bear and hope that she doesn't. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's as a, as a uh, I don't I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of parliament where, where you're, a, you're an infant until you're seven, then you're a minor until you're 18. 
Ladies and gents, we'll park it there. If you've got more questions, come and harass me. But uh, for now, so I mean, I go back to my very, very last slide, which I'll get to in half a second. Um, and I was going to put a Nike logo there, but I thought let's not, you know, Nike will probably come and sue us. Um, just do it. Let's go open a TFSA. If your broker doesn't offer it, harass them. In your example, perhaps not. Uh, maybe if you've got some high dividend yields in there, you want to move those into the process. But he's, in essence, what did Minister Nene do? And I, he's a great man. I, we've, you know, we've had brilliant finance ministers for 20 years. And what does he do? Minister Nene stands up and basically takes money from us here and takes money from us there and then takes money. You wait until you see the petrol price increase next month. And here he actually gave us some money. But only if we take it. We've now got to actually go and action it. It's not like money he sends us in the post. We've actually got to open the TFSA, hoist stuff in it there. And in the first year, we're going to make the princely sum of close to nothing. Um, but when you come back in 17 years' time, I won't be here, I'll be hopefully by then surfing in Durban. But when someone comes back here in 17 years' time, uh, yeah, man, it's free money and it's going to add up. It's going to be significant in time. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. If you want the presentation, uh, uh, and Paul will have it, you can mail me, simon at justonelap.com. Uh, it's on the website. Go and open one. Thank you very, very much for your time this evening. <laughs>